Cool, so we'll start recording the meeting from here. Uh, just to finish up uh, any last announcements, I want to open it up to anybody um, who has uh, any questions, uh, exciting things to share, um, anything from different presentations that they're going to be giving, uh, job openings in the community, anything related to data science that they want to uh, unmute themselves for and, uh, and give it an announcement for. Cool. No worries if nobody has anything. Uh, if you do, if you find something and you want to either just type it in the chat um, or mention it at the end of the presentation, I'll open it up again. Um, but in the meantime, uh, you know, just keep that in your back pocket. Um, if you're interested in presenting, um, feel free to, to notice that as well. Um, and if you are someone who's already messaged me either uh, about an announcement you want to make or giving your own presentation for one of the user group meetings, and I haven't gotten back to you, uh, again, I might have just missed your message or I just totally blanked on it. I'm not ignoring you, I promise. <laughs> so feel free to reach out to me again. Uh, I'll also put my email in the chat so that way it's easy for you to have it and just shoot me another uh, reminder or follow up if that's what you need to do. So if no one else has anything, I think I'm going to go ahead and pass things over to Enzo so that way he can start off his presentation. So Enzo, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Can everyone hear me? I'm going to presume that's a yes. So I want to start off by thanking everyone for attending. I especially want to thank Jacob and uh, the Desert Data Science user group for hosting this technical session. I'm Enzo Vernon, and today I'm going to uh, talk about the deep learning concept, the convolutional neural network, by reviewing its biological roots, covering its importance, delving into uh, neural no network composition, and then concluding it with an application of transfer learning with CNN. I do want to stress, though, that the opinions are my own and not necessarily a reflection of others' attitudes. I want to begin by discerning that artificial intelligence is the overarching discipline of computers learning to carry out tasks. Machine learning is a subset of AI where an algorithm processes a data set to detect shared patterns, and deep learning is considered an evolution of machine learning that uses artificial neural networks to make highly accurate inferences on uh, production data it's never seen with minimal human intervention. So what is an artificial neural network and how does it relate to a biological neural network? A neural network is the basis of deep learning that essentially mimics the functionality of the human brain to process information and learns to make informed conclusions. In 1943, scientists Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts, I, if I'm recalling correctly, understood that mimicking the functionality of the human brain is a worthwhile endeavor because our ability to rationalize and share unique perspectives with one another on a large scale is what makes our species so successful. This functionality stems from biological units called neurons. Biological neurons are interconnected nerve cells that receive and transmit chemical and uh, electrical signals. The dendrites are the branches that receive the signals and the axon transmits them. The synapses serve as the gate for the communication between the neurons. From a computer science perspective, the neuron is an algorithm that receives a set of independent variables and then compares that with the weighted sum of its, that it receives to its current hypothesis and then outputs a new value. Each layer in a neural network is composed of uh, neurons that formulate their own conclusions and pass that 
or their understanding to the next layer. And this, this ultimately culminates into a, a paradigm or a generalized belief system. Think of these layers as functions. So in a, a CNN, we, it's a, it could be compared to a, a visual cortex of the human brain. And the primary visual cortex, V1, would preserve spatial re relationships that it receives from the retina. And then the V2 layer would filter for shape. V3 would detect motion and so on. In terms of real world applicability, it's important to understand why deep learning is a worthwhile investment. In business, neural networks will be able to analyze customer behaviors, tailor ads to suit customer interests, and then recommend how to uh, adjust prices to maximize revenue. It will revolutionize transportation with autonomous vehicles using convolutional neural networks. But most importantly, they can be used to craft personalized treatment strategies for clinical patients. Now, in deep learning, there are three primary types of models, linear regression, binary classification, and multi-class classification. A linear regression model predicts a numeric value. For example, what price will this house sell for based on the number of rooms and the square footage? Binary classification predicts one of two possible target labels, like should toilet paper hang under or over. And uh, rather intuitively, multi-class classification problems predict the probabilities of three plus target labels, like does adding a ghost pepper to a curry make it too hot, too cold, or just right? For the purpose of this technical session, we're going to focus on the binary classification between a cat and a dog. So we start off by importing our libraries. I'm using the Keras library with a TensorFlow 2 backend to build our models. I'm then importing the image data generator library to help with pre-processing the images to assist with uh, directory structure. I import OS. NumPy helps with handling uh, the multi-dimensional arrays. And uh, finally, I'm um, using uh, the matplotlib library to visualize the data sets and uh, model performance. For easy reference, I typically define my helper functions at the top of the file, and this one just plots the graph depending on the trained model and the metric that we pass to it. The metric is either going to be accuracy or the loss. Next, I get our uh, cat and dog uh, data set from a Google API and then store it locally in a temp folder. After unzipping the data set, I define our training and validation subdirectories for the image data generator, which are coded to read images from subdirectories and then automatically label them with the name of said folder. So for example, if we have a training train directory that consists of a cat subdirectory and a dog subdirectory, those will be automatically labeled for us. I then typically like to get a visual of our data set. Not only that, but getting the metadata, like how many files are in each directory is crucial to working with the generators. 
passing batches of images into a model is or are their primary functions. So, for example, if you have uh, 2,000 training images, which we do, we have 1,000 cat training images and 1,000 dog training images, we're going to have to pre-process the batches of images in sets of 20. The number of steps will have to work in tandem with the number of batches, so we'll have to have 100 steps per cycle, also known as an epoch. Here, I'm just showing a, uh, or I'm showing eight training images from each target label that will ultimately be passed into our model with the generators. And again, I want to stress that that passing batches of images into a model to do real-time pre-processing is the image data generator's primary function. So we define our image data generator, and then we have we're going to have to set up the the flow from directory to get our images into the model, and we're going to uh, resize all of the images into a uniform shape, which is going to be a target size of 150. <clears throat> sorry. 150 pixels height and width. And we define our batch size, we define our training directory, and then it's either going to be a cat or a dog, so the classification mode is going to be binary. In order to understand how a uh, neural network makes the best predictions, though, we first have to get comfortable with certain key terms and concepts. Gradient descent shows the trajectory of prediction accuracy. The lowest point in gradient descent is known as the global minimum, and it correlates with the prediction with the highest accuracy. Now, there can be other values in gradient descent, and those are known as local minimums. We never want our model to be at any local minimum because that means our model's predictions are suboptimal. This is not a good place to be. So we train our we train our model until it finds the global minimum. Now there is a hyperparameter called the learning rate in gradient descent, and it's commonly represented by the Greek symbol alpha, and it's the normalized rate at which the model learns to adapt. And if we set the learning rate too large of a value, then it's possible that our model actually overestimates the global minimum, overshoots it, and ends up settling on a suboptimal prediction. This is a, a symptom of underfitting because the model has lost some of the data granularity it uses to consistently make accurate inferences. That said, if the learning rate is excessively small, then the time it takes to train a model becomes painfully long, potentially costing an unnecessary amount of time and resources. I want to emphasize that having excessively small learning, it doesn't necessarily guarantee success either. There are other hyperparameters at play, like batch size, and you could simply just have a bad model. Not only that, but having an excessively small learning rate can actually lead to misleading success known as overfitting, which is when a model becomes so accustomed to the training data set, it is incapable of making accurate inferences on production data it's never seen. The point being, we want to find the sweet spot between speed and accuracy. We use artificial neural networks because it speeds up the time to find these optimized values via gradient descent. Neural networks have three main components, an input layer, hidden layers, or and an output layer. 
A neural network's first layer takes in an array of standardized inputs. Like I mentioned earlier, if you don't pre-process your inputs into a uniform and efficient format, the model won't be able to make sense of the data. Each input goes into each hidden layer neuron where they're summed and an activation function, commonly a rectifier, sigmoid, or hyperbolic tangent function, identifies a unique relationship between the inputs and then decides on the importance of that relationship to the next neuron. The activation function adds nonlinearity to the model. And this is important because in a real world data set, there's going to be randomness. You're not, you're, it's, you almost never get a, a direct relationship. In technical terms, the activation function is a regression analysis that is dictated by the rate, rate of change, the slope. The weights represent the slope. And going back to this GIF, the relationships are what I was alluding to, are called weights and are represented by these lines. So if the weights represent the slope, that means that the output y equals the slope w times the summed input x plus the bias b. When the learning, the weights are altered by the steepness of the curve, and then the bias offsets it left or right so that the entire curve shifts and then better fits the data set. Simply put, the activation function tracks the summed input commonly within the thresholds of negative one to one or zero and positive infinity. And the accuracy adjustment, which is a derivative of the prediction accuracy in gradient descent, is multiplied against the weight, effectively updating it. Updating weights are how a neural network learns to make better predictions. This is an important concept to understand because a neural network can have multiple hidden layers that refine the weights between the inputs and the outputs, hence the term deep. Since all weights are interconnected, you need to proportionally update all of them. If you have a particularly deep neural network, then the derived gradient that's being applied to the weights becomes proportionally smaller for each layer back. Eventually, the gradient will become so small that it won't be able to adequately update the layers near the origin, meaning that the weights that crescendo to the predictions are ultimately predicated on untrained layers near, well, the origin. This is what we call a vanishing gradient problem. Now, there are several ways to resolve this per neural network type, but the most popular and straightforward is to use the ReLU activation function, the rectifier function, on the hidden layer neurons, which just means return x if x is greater than 0, else return 0 for all the pixel values in an image. The neuron in the output layer, aka the target label, is the neural network's prediction. The activation function in the output layer, commonly a sigmoid function for binary classification, organizes the two predictions into a valid distribution of 100% and then selects the prediction with the highest probability. That prediction is then used as input for the error function. The error function which is commonly referred to as a loss or cost function, determ determines the accuracy of said prediction. Our cat and dog classifier will be using a binary cross-entropy loss. Binary cross-entropy measures how far the prediction is 
from the actual for each class, which is either zero and one, and then averages the errors to obtain the final loss. <clears throat> Backpropagation is what I was alluding to before when the model learns by taking the derivative of the loss function and then using it to update the weights at each update cycle. The ultimate goal is the ultimate goal is convergence, which means that we want our loss and gradient descent to be as close as possible to zero, the global minimum, because that means that we have a very high prediction accuracy. So to put this all together, each epoch is or which is just an iteration in neural network speak, trains a model on a very large data set. And then that trained model is validated against a test data set. You repeat this process for several epochs. And ultimately, after either adjusting the higher parameters or the model itself, your model will be able to consistently make accurate inferences on production data it's never seen. The test data set. So in code, our model's input layer is a flattening layer. This just means that we're converting a multi-dimensional array into a one-dimensional array. So for example, here we have an image. And then uh, once we apply flattening to it, the result is going to be that all pixels in the image are essentially rolled out into a single vector column. The reason that we do that is that because we need to insert the inputs into the artificial neural network. And if we didn't do this, then the number of layers in the model would have a direct correlation with the number of inputs, which would be absurd. Afterwards, we apply a couple of dense layers. The second dense layer serves as our hidden layer. And it's also called a fully connected layer. And this is where the model looks at what detected features most correlate with a particular class. And then our output layer serves, well, it, it returns one unit, which is a single neuron, and it's either going to be zero or one. We then compile the model by building it with a loss, an optimizer, and any objective metrics. The atom optimizer then propagates the binary cross entropy loss, or I guess the derivative of the binary cross entropy loss, to adjust the weights and improve prediction accuracy. I'm using an atom optimizer because the default parameters for the atom optimizer do well on most problems. That said, later on in uh, this session, I'm going to actually uh, specify the learning rates. So after training the model, which another, another term is to fit the model, we assign the trained model to a history variable. The model trains for uh, 10 epochs, each epoch has 100 uh, steps, and uh, the, we're passing batches of 20 into uh, the model. Our starting accuracy is 51%, our starting validation accuracy is 51%, but we don't really improve much after that. As you can see, our uh, performance is actually quite atrocious we're underfitting. Thankfully, this is where convolutional neural networks can really help us. 
Now that we have a fundamental understanding of how neural networks work, we're finally going to deep dive into what makes convolutional neural networks unique. Popularized by, uh, what's his name? Jan LeCun, a CNN is just a neural network that has some additional pre-processing steps. Even though uh, convolutional neural networks can be used for a wide range of fields, it's predominantly used for computer vision. Computer vision essentially just aims to give computers high level understanding of the world around them by feeding them uh, observed image or video data. CNNs are perfect for computer vision because at the very core, all they do are compressed images for granular features, as you can see with this GIF. By features, I'm referring to uh, straight edges, simple colors, curves, etc. The most basic elements that all images share with one another. Every image is a vector. And if you guys don't know, a vector is just a quantity that describes direction and magnitude, the shape. The shape of an image has width, height, and one or three color channels. It defaults to one color channel if the original is in grayscale and three if it's in color, some variation of red, blue, and green. Each image is composed of pixels that denote perceived intensity. The value of these pixels are represented by an array with a range from 0 to 255. It's, it's really small. It's a 256 capacity because the memory space on modern computers is assigned in powers of two bytes. Each pixel is assigned a full byte of eight bits. Two to the eighth power is 256. This is important to understand because whenever you're dealing with massive data sets, not just images, we, you always want to make the processing of the data set as easy as possible, which means we should always normalize our values, or in this case, the pixels. And that just that means proportionally rescaling the values between zero and one. <clears throat> Normalizing the uh, or normalization is actually particularly easy with uh, image data generators because all we have to do is pass a rescale parameter and then the target value. So. This part isn't too different from what we did earlier. The only difference, again, is that we're normalizing our values. But uh, even though it doesn't look like a lot, it actually does make a huge difference. From there, we're ready to compress our images with convolutional layers. Every convolutional layer has a filter. Well, it has more than one filter. Each filter represents a unit slash neuron in a conv hidden layer. This filter is defined as an array of numbers, as you can see here. The numbers equal the weights that change over time. And as you can see in this GIF, the, uh, the filter actually goes over an image and then calculates the new pixel values. Think of uh, filters as feature identifiers. Now, it's, it's important to uh, note that in order to uh, to filter properly, you need a valid set of values. Now you can you can get around this by padding an image 
in several different ways. Like you could you could mirror or just put a bunch of zeros on here, but you do, you do need uh, values in this filter. So as uh, the filter scans a field, it's multiplying the values in the filter with the original pixel values. And then these multiplications are summed and you get your new pixel value. So for example, we start off with 192. And I, I forgot to mention this, but whenever we have a filter, we're really only calculating one pixel, the, the central pixel, which is why you need a valid set of values. So as you can see here, our current pixel value is 192. Then we have our filter definition, and we multiply the corresponding cells together, 0 times negative 1, and so on, to get the everything in around our uh, current pixel value to get our new pixel value. And then we repeat this process for every location on input by striding right until we reach the end of our image. Each unique location on the input produ produces a pixel value. And we're then left with a feature map. By building a feature map, our uh, convolutions have detected low level features such as edges and curves, but that's still not going to be enough. As you can imagine, our work isn't done. In order to predict whether an image is an object, we need the model to be able to recognize higher level features, such as paws or ears. In order to recognize these higher level features, we have to add additional convolutional layers. As the data set passes through these additional conv layers, we output more feature maps that represent increasingly more complex features. So it's building on top of one another, like we saw with the uh, biology slide. This culminates with some filters that activate whether, whether there's a dog running or a cat scowling. That said, simply adding uh, convolutional layers won't be uh, enough. Relatively speaking, we're creating a ton of images by running our inputs through these conv hidden layers. This is a good thing because we're increasing our level of granularity depending on the number of filters slash neurons per layer, but we are also exponentially adding more data with each conv layer. The majority of this data won't be valuable to our classifier. For example, I guess we'll just take this one, for example. We compress this image, but there's still a bunch of pixel values that really don't amount to much for a classifier. So to counter this irrelevant data issue, we use a process called pooling. After filtering an image, we drastically reduce its shape by selecting a single pixel value in a, a uh, pixel neighborhood to represent that pixel neighborhood, just to go along with this slide. And the benefit of pooling is that it desensitizes our classifier to the orientation of the features in a feature map. So if for whatever reason we have a, an image of a shoe that's pointing uh, to uh, 
the top right corner of the screen, our, uh, our pooling layer, layers are going to help the model realize that, okay, even though it's in a different direction or even of a different size, this is still the face of the shoe. <clears throat> the kernel size of a pooling layer is commonly a two by two matrix, which will reduce the number of pixels in an image by half. Typically, we use uh, max pooling, which means we take the maximum pixel value in a pixel receptive field, as you can see here. Simply put, we only account for the most prominent elements in, in a feature map that helps with decent sizing direction. And I'm not going to go over this because, well, I basically just did. But uh, I guess I guess I will go over it. We have our conpaten layer. We have to define the input shape because this is our input layer. And then we have a max pooling layer. We add another conpaten layer to extrapolate features from our feature map and build on top of that. And then we do that one more time until we get to our flattening layer. I do want to point out, though, that as you can see, it might be easier if I just go to the summary. We have, we start off, it says that our input layer, or the output of our input layer is 148 by 148 pixels. And this is just the number of filter slash neurons. This is bad for not using our image data generators are handling the batch, so this, this is going to be none. But the reason why it's 148 instead of 150 is because if we're using a, a three by three matrix, we can't start in the very top corner. We have to start one pixel in on each side, which gives us 150 which gives us, sorry, uh, 148 width and height. And then uh, our uh, pooling layer will uh, cut that in half. And then we just keep doing that over and over again until we get back to the point where we have to flatten our pooled feature maps. And uh, we flatten our pool of feature maps into a, a zinc, uh, into a single vector, like we saw earlier, and then uh, map the uh, features to predicted labels. And this is where I am specifying the learning rate for our Atom optimizer. Other than that, nothing else is really different. And I made that to denote performance between the two models. And we start off with 52%. Uh, that's, that's good. And uh, after training for 10 epochs, we have an exceptionally high training accuracy, but a uh, very relative or relatively low validation accuracy. We're overfitting. And that can be visualized with Matplotlib. Now, this is not good because, as you can recall, if our model fits the uh, training data set too well, it's obviously not able to, uh, to uh, 
classify data it's ne never seen before, which kind of makes it useless. Because <laughs> the whole point of a model is to be able to generalize and then uh, detect patterns. And this GIF shows, OK, this is what we are. This is what's what's happening. And then an underfitting model, which we saw our first model do, is right here. Now, they're combating a overfitting can be challenging, but it's after you do it, several times, you kind of get a hang of at least where to start. I'm not going to say that it's it, it gets very easy, but it's you you start to develop strategies on how to hopefully resolve it quickly. And we can start off by increasing our the number of training samples. That said, the data set that I got from the Google API has a limited number of images, like we saw, 1,000 cat training images and 1,000 dog training images. You need a lot of data to train a neural network from scratch, and access to more data isn't always available. And so our cat and dog classifier data set is actually very small. So we're going to apply a technique called data augmentation on our images, which means that the uh, number of images in the data set are going to be increased exponentially by manipulating, manipulating our current data set, as you can see here. Instead of just having one bird, we can uh, either rotate it, shift it, and whatnot. We account for a variety of these conditions, such as orientation, access locations, scale, by synthetic, synthetically creating the data set, or synthetically creating the data and then adding it to our original data set. Thankfully, this is, again, very easy with image data generators. All we have to do is pass some parameters and then specify how much we want to modify the originals and in what way. Keep in mind, though, that since we are adding more data to our model, we also probably want to increase the number of epochs so that our model will be able to filter out low low level features and then build on top of that up until high level features that said as a safeguard we should set up an early stopping callback Early stopping is pretty self-explanatory. If we train for too long, we might fit the data too well. If our validation and training accuracy diverges too much, as you can see here, and as you can see here, then we should probably stop our training. So in the code, I'm uh, applying data augmentation to the uh, to the training and validation generators. And then I set up a uh, early stopping callback, which I'm going to pass into uh, our, uh, our uh, fit method. Counterintuitively, another effective to uh, or another effective method to prevent overfitting is to use a technique called dropout, which means that we're going to randomly drop out a uh, percentage of neurons in a layer. 
essentially we're forcing the network to train itself evenly across all neurons, generalizing the data that leads to a prediction. Keep in mind though that if you drop out too many neurons, you could uh, be susceptible to underfitting, generally speaking. And from what I've seen uh, from her peers, dropout generally ranges from uh, 10 to 20%. And this is how you would uh, specify it with a float value. We also add a, uh, a regularizer that enhances the uh, loss function by punishing the model for being a little too complex. So if we use an L2 regularization, which gives our uh, better performing neurons more importance or value in our classifier and then downplays the underperforming neurons by squaring at the values. That said, I you probably shouldn't use L2 regularization if you have outliers, but our data set only consists of cats and dogs, so we don't really have any outliers. It's not really representative of reality in that sense, but it's it's ideal for this technical session. So here, again, we start off with a conv 2D layer to find the input shape, 150 uh, pixels, width and height, three color channels. We pull it, we do that several times. And then after, after the uh, final pooling, or after the final pooling layer, we drop out a number of, uh, a random number of neurons now i i've actually added a dropout to uh, to each max pooling layer in the past and it's it's worked well for uh for my other models in reinforcement learning but for for this model it actually didn't provide that much benefit to really include it, so I just added it to the very end. And then in uh, our classifier, we are uh, adding uh, the uh, L2 regularization here. And then we have an apple error, zero or one. that uses a sigmoid activation function. And I probably forgot to mention this, but total parameters is the weights plus the hyperparameters. Trainable params means the weights, non-trainable equals the hyperparameters. Then we compile the model and we train the model as before. As you can see, I uh, increased the number of uh, epochs and I passed a new argument callbacks. And then I, I don't know if you guys saw, but I defined my callback and my instantiation of my callback class as callbacks. And we start off with a 52% training accuracy, 51% training accuracy after 30 epochs. It improves by 20, 20%, but it's not great. Uh, I mean, yeah, I would say that we're underfitting. We're back to underfitting. And you can make an argument that if if we increase the number of epochs, that hypothetically it could get up to a reasonable accuracy for for both training and validation accuracy, but it wouldn't be an optimal use of computation or our time. That said, we did solve the uh, overfitting problem. Now, as we've seen it with the past models, it can be prone to underfitting, it can be prone to overfitting, and data augmentation may not always be enough to solve this problem. The idea behind transfer learning 
is to use the knowledge of a pre-trained model that has trained on a absolutely massive data set on a specific task or for a specific task. This gives us the trifecta of benefits. One, a higher starting accuracy. Two, faster convergence. And three, superior classifications. In computer vision, it's very common to use gold standard models like ResNet, VGG, or Inception. For this technical session, I'm going to import the Inception one. Next, I get the pre-trained model weights from a Google API and then store that H5 file locally. I then define the Inception CNN by specifying the input shape and then not including the top layer or the top classifier layer that has several target labels because we only want to target two target labels. We're essentially going to add our classifier on top of this model. After instantiation, I load the pre-trained weights onto the model. Now, I don't want to fine tune these weights and you can fine tune them if you want with each pass through or epoch while the data set is being processed. But these trains are these layers have already been trained. So I just loop through the layers and freeze them to make them untrainable. I'm then getting the output layer in the Inception CNN so that its knowledge can serve as the base of my binary classifier, like I mentioned earlier. Which, as you can see here, here's the output layer, here's the base. And this format this is just another way of building a model. You have the, you flan your output, and then you're basically just passing the X through each layer and then defining the layers. And just as a precaution, I drop out 15% of the uh, classifier neurons. So just in case my model starts to, or so my model doesn't overfit again. And I have also printed out a summary of the inception model that includes our uh, classifier and as you can see, it's an, it's absolutely enormous. Oh, that wasn't good. Yeah, it's it's huge. I then compile the model, train it per usual, and and I'm also using the callback that we defined earlier. So as you can see, after we start training, our, uh, our model contrasts to previous model performance starts off at 84% with actually a higher validation accuracy, which would be concerning if it wasn't the first epoch. But then uh, after that, we start to trend above 90% for most of the way, they're, they're comparable, and then accuracy overtakes validation accuracy. If the two aren't inverted, that means that something's not right, your, your model won't be able to, yours is not making sense of the data properly, and it's not gonna be able to classify, because you, your validation accuracy should almost never be significantly higher than your training accuracy. But that's not the case here. So we uh, train for 30 epochs, and as you can see, we end up with a 97% training accuracy and a 94 validation accuracy. We have a respectable cat and dog classifier. We're not overfitting, we're not underfitting, 
And here is a graph of our loss. And I also want to point out that previously, I had a callback that was defined as 97% for both. So that's why I didn't stop at 94. And I just haven't run this in a couple of days. But it probably should have stopped somewhere around, well, I don't know where both 94 and 90 were both training accuracy and validation accuracy are higher than 94. Uh, I should definitely have stopped at least at Epoch 28. But yeah, so there you have it. So to conclude this technical session, artificial neural networks help us to make informed decisions with a high degree of confidence. Convolutional neural networks optimize the time and effort needed to make these smart decisions by filtering for the most prominent features and then compressing the inputs into an efficient shape. Transfer learning with convolutional neural networks allows us to use our colleagues' proven findings and apply it towards a specific use case so that we don't have to squander our most important resource, time. I've aggregated some beginner-friendly resources that I personally use as references, which I'd be more than happy to share with anyone that's interested. I hope this lecture has demystified convolutional neural networks for everyone here because their application is relatively, well, I mean, I say, I say it in quotes, relatively simple, but their potential value is enormous. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions from anyone? Anything in the chat? Let's see, I don't particularly see anything. Cool, that's totally fine. If you have any questions, feel free to you know wrap up or unmute yourself or or follow up in the chat or online later if you want to. Um, but in that case, thank you so so much, Enzo, for that awesome awesome presentation. Yeah, I'll give a clap. I, people want to put clap emojis in the chat. That's cool too. <laughs> Um, <laughs> perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Um, again, uh, anybody, I just wanted to open up one last time too, before everyone signs off any announcements that anyone wants to make in terms of, uh, job openings, uh, other presentations that they've got going on, anything exciting in the, uh, in the community. Awesome. Nishnambi says excellent presentation right on. Cool. I should probably stop sharing. Uh, thank you again. My name is Enzo Vernon, and uh, thank you, Jacob, for uh, hosting uh, or letting me uh, share my passion for machine learning. Absolutely, Enzo. Thanks so much for that presentation. Um, if, in case you guys didn't hear at the beginning, um, again, we will be putting this on our YouTube page if you wanted to review some stuff. Uh, Enzo also mentioned that he might be able to get me the uh, repo um, or at least a copy of this presentation if you'd like to go over it yourself. So stay tuned for all of that. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the meeting and let people enjoy the rest of their evenings. So thanks so much for enjoying our uh, second online meeting, and hopefully we'll be seeing you guys either online or in person, depending on how things are going uh, in a month. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>